Good morning, everyone. I'm Lynn Haltain. I'm the Executive Director at the Victoria Law Foundation, and welcome to this Victoria Law Foundation Research Network event on a topic of significant discussion and debate in, in all manner of circles, self-represented litigants, challenges and solutions for a wicked problem. And we are so delighted to have Dr. Jessica Mant as our special guest speaker for this session, looking at the experience of self-represented people, particularly in family law. And I'll introduce you to her in just a moment. But first, the Victoria Law Foundation office stands on unceded Wurundjeri land. And this morning I'm on Bunwarun country and I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians, recognizing their abiding connection to land, waterways and community. And it's my privilege on this perfect spring morning here at least, pay my respects to the elders and to all the generations who have nurtured this land for over 50,000 years. That's literally millions of blue sky days like today. We believe that acknowledging the past is an essential step in building a better and more equitable future. And we recognize the impact of colonization, its legacy of injustice, and the marginalization of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We aim to break down the barriers to justice for all Victorians through our work in research, education and grants. We are committed to making a sincere and positive contribution to a better justice system for all of us, especially those most in need. So a little housekeeping before we get the show on the road. We are in webinar format, as you would be aware, so only panellists can be seen and heard today. Please use the chat function to introduce yourself and tell us where you are and to make comments throughout. But if you would like to put a question, then please make sure you use the Q&A function where you can also up upvote other people's questions and they have a greater likelihood of being put. And we'll get to as many of those as we can. We are recording today and we will distribute the video after the event. So if you've got friends and colleagues who've missed it and would like to catch up, then they have that opportunity and please let them know that uh, the video will be sent to everyone who's been registered. It also will go up on our website as well. So format for today, I'll introduce you in just a moment to Jessica Mant, and then we'll have a panel discussion which will be led by Dr. Hugh MacDonald, who's our principal researcher here at the VLF, together with Bridget McAloon, who's the acting manager of research and evaluation with the Victoria Law Foundation, uh, Victoria Legal Aid, apologies, Bridget. And we will weave your questions into that panel discussion as well. So get us underway. Let me introduce you to Dr. Jessica Mant, who is a lecturer at Monash University in Law, an empirical researcher specialising in access to justice, legal aid and family law. She's got a book coming out in December. It's called Litigants in Person and the Family Justice System out through Heart Publishing. So stay tuned for more information on that, which examines access to justice for unrepresented parties in private family law cases. This morning, Dr. Matt will draw lessons and insights for the Australian context based on her complementary work from other jurisdictions, as well as empirical research on self-represented litigants and their experiences of legal aid lawyers in England and in Wales. So without further ado, Jessica, the floor is yours. Great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's great to be joining you. Let me just share my screen. Great, thank you so much. Um, Yes, thank you so much to everybody at the VLF for inviting me to talk about this really important issue. What I'd like to do today is to talk you through some of the problems which are typically associated with self-represented litigants um, before touching on some of the possible solutions to those problems. So in terms of the problems when we talk about SRLs and self-representation as a whole, I find that these problems tend to fall on two sides of the same coin. On one side, you have the difficulties and the challenges that people experience when they are required to navigate the legal system without assistance. And on the other side, you have the pressures that this in turn creates for the legal system as a whole, uh, in terms of additional work that it creates for lawyers and judges and court staff, as well as uh, the delays and backlog that it can cause for the legal system. 
And in terms of the possible solutions, I think when we talk about solutions to the self-representation problem, it's really important that we acknowledge the, um, the fact that the family court plays a really important function in terms of providing a, an important safety net for people who simply cannot resolve their problems through any other means. But at the same time, self-representation uh, provides a really useful kind of case point where we can look at how and why people find themselves as self-represented litigants and then work backwards to think, well, how might we possibly intervene and help these people at an earlier stage before their problems escalate to such this point? And now a useful place to start is to define what a self-represented litigant actually is. And of course, we call SRLs different things depending on the jurisdiction in which we find ourselves. Uh, but the most basic definition that we tend to rely on is a, par a party who arrives at court without legal representation. But this definition is really only the tip of the iceberg in terms of who SRLs are and why they end up self-representing. You may have a particular image in mind when you think of an, a self-represented litigant. You may think of somebody who uh, has never had legal representation and manages their entire case from start to finish without assistance. Uh, but there are also people who perhaps start off represented and then they get to a point in their case where they lose their representation, perhaps because they feel that they can take the case forward on their own without help, or because they run out of funds to pay for their lawyer, or because the relationship with their lawyer is broken down. At the same time, there's also quite a lot of variation in terms of the level of prior advice and information that SRLs may have before they arrive at the family court. You may have some very experienced, very knowledgeable SRLs who turn up at court unrepresented because they have spent their limited funds, they've targeted their funds at receiving comprehensive legal advice, and then they're conducting the litigation aspect of their case on their own to save costs. Or you may have other SRLs who are turning up because they have had uh, limited access to advice and information before they arrive at court. And what that means really is that we have a spectrum of SRLs who uh, potentially come with a very uh, variable range of capabilities and understandings about what to expect when they get to the family court. And this places a great deal of burden and uh, work onto the court staff and judges and lawyers that are working there, because the onus is then on them in the moment to ascertain the level of understanding, the level of capability that exists among those SRLs, and then to try and respond appropriately in the moment. But despite the diversity of circumstances in which people self-represent, there is some common knowledge or some established knowledge about who they tend to be, what kind of characteristics SRLs tend to have, and, and what kind of motivates them to self-represent usually. And these come from a whole host of uh, international research studies which have been undertaken trying to dig down into some of those questions. And so these studies have taken a range of different approaches to try and understand how and why SRLs come to court and what the experiences are like when they get there. Some have reviewed kind of the case files that have underpinned the hearings involving SRLs. Some have sat in and observed SRLs self-representing in court hearings to work out how they respond to other participants um, and how they behave in those hearings. Others have conducted interviews and focus groups with judges, lawyers and court staff to work out what kind of issues are created in hearings involving self-represented litigants, how they typically respond to them. Uh, and then some have also conducted direct interviews with SRLs themselves to try and work out what are the motivations, what are the experiences and what are the perceptions that come out of the experiences of self-representation. So what I've been doing for the last few years is drawing together that kind of international evidence base working out some common themes which have cropped up across these different jurisdictions. And then I've also explored those through my own qualitative interviews with self-represented litigants, which I conducted in England and Wales, which is where I was based at the time. And so diving in then to what those studies tell us about who SRLs are and why they self-represent, we can see that SRLs tend to be those who fall into the justice gap. And the justice gap is a term that we often use to describe the gap in legal aid provision that exists for those whose incomes are too high to be able to establish eligibility for legal aid, 
but too low to be able to realistically afford to pay for their own legal representation. So unsurprisingly, SRLs tend to be those with limited financial resources, but the studies also indicate that SRLs also tend to be those disproportionately represented by those with low levels of formal education, uh, learning difficulties, language barriers, mental health problems, and of course, an extremely high prevalence of domestic abuse and family violence allegations. And usually at this point, people are wondering, well, why on earth would somebody in any of these sorts of circumstances choose to self-represent? Well, the reality is that some do. Some choose to self-represent because of an internal sense of justice or a deep mistrust of the legal profession. Others are unfortunately forced into the court process and they don't necessarily choose to self-represent. Others are forced into the court process by the other party taking action against them or perhaps people who have tried dispute resolution, but it's failed, or would like to try a dispute resolution, but the other party refuses to engage. By far the most common reason that people self-represent is because they cannot afford to pay for legal representation. And so the, I think this is a really important point to emphasize because there is sometimes a tendency for us to assume that self-represented litigants are a, a troublesome bunch of um, litigious people who want to clog up the court system unnecessarily and in practice a lot of them are people who have reached a crisis point, a point of last resort where they feel there's no other option but to self-represent and may actually be looking to the family court uh, for a solution. And so then we get to start asking really interesting questions, questions that I find really interesting which is well, how do they get to that point in the first place? How do they fall into these gaps in provision? How do they reach a point where self-representation becomes the only option? And I think that one of the factors we can pull out is the nature of family law problems themselves. Legal problems that come with a relationship breakdown are rarely experienced in isolation. Actually, the process of a relationship breaking down can frequently trigger other legal problems because of the changes in legal status that it can bring. So for example, Commonly as alongside legal problems relating to family law, you will also have legal problems relating to housing, social security, and perhaps even immigration. And this means that problem solving strategies that people take when they experience a family law problem can be um, of limited effect in some circumstances. So for example, a family may uh, try to resolve one aspect of their legal problem, but because of the inherently clustered nature of family issues, there may be other aspects of the problem which go unresolved and perhaps escalate or become further entrenched or further com uh, more complicated uh, to the point where they become quite urgent problems. Of course, it's not just about people needing to know that they need to take action. It's also about the availability and the accessibility of services and advice organizations once they do, do take action. And this is really important in family law in particular because having an accurate understanding of your legal entitlements and rights uh, can be a very important starting point from which people are able to negotiate future arrangements. So legal advice, legal advice pays a very significant role in the resolution of family problems before it gets to a point where uh, self-representation appears necessary. And of course, all of this has been uh, amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic, because as a result of the pandemic, lots of people are experiencing more legal problems. Uh, in particular, lots of people are experiencing problems for the first time. For example, in relation to financial insecurity, employment issues, housing issues, uh, everything that's been affected by the pandemic has created this increase in legal need, need for legal advice, need for legal support. And that has an impact on how uh, capable services and advice organizations are to respond uh, to the needs of others. It increases the demand for their services in a way which may limit their capacity to do outreach or to offer pro bono support to those who fall outside the eligibility parameters for legal aid. And so taking all of that together, it's perhaps quite unsurprising that SRLs tend to be those who fall into this justice gap and for whom problems escalate quite significantly to a point where they feel that self-representation is their only option. 
And so for the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is talk you through some of the problems that tend to arise when SRLs arrive at the family court. And the first is uh, related to the procedures that underpin the family court process. So the family court process is underpinned by a whole host of procedures and processes which are designed so that uh, issues involved in cases can be explored in sufficient depth and that decisions can be made appropriately, consistently and effectively, sorry, efficiently. Um, but of course, because SRLs are unfamiliar with those processes, inevitably they make mistakes. Inevitably, they fail to comply with expectations and may behave in ways that are unanticipated. They may also struggle to appreciate how different hearings fit together in the sense of moving between different aspects of the court process. And so usually in response to uh, an SRL who experiences these sorts of problems, the family court will respond by trying to introduce a degree of flexibility into those processes. So for example, judges may allow SRLs additional time to uh, speak during hearings or perhaps the opportunity to submit extra papers or to submit paperwork at a later stage. Um, and it may also involve judges and lawyers taking on tasks on behalf of SRLs. So a judge, for example, may conduct cross-examination on behalf of an SRL or a, an opposing lawyer may take on the task of preparing paperwork or court bundles on behalf of an SRL. And this, of course, helps in terms of the procedural barriers, but it also creates a significant additional burden for the court process. It also um, risks creating ethical issues in terms of the relationship between the other party and the, par and the lawyer who is representing them, um, and also potentially perceptions of unfairness if the judge or anybody else in the court process is perceived to be trying to help the SRL rather than the represented party. So to illustrate that, what I've done is I've included a couple of quotes here from the people that I interviewed. So this is a quote uh, from John, who was one of the parents I interviewed, and he explained how going to the family court, uh, the process can often be quite overwhelming. So he would explain that loads of times he got to the court process and thought he was there to discuss one thing, but then found that the judge was ready to make a decision about something entirely different. And so what that meant for John was that he had to engage in the hearing uh, in, the, in the moment, off the top of his head, with his words. So what this shows is that SRLs may be required to participate in a way uh, that avoids the fact that they haven't been able to prepare. So this is obviously incredibly stressful for the SRL themselves, but of course creates obvious knock-on effects for the court process where judges and lawyers have to then coach SRLs through the process because they haven't been able to anticipate or prepare for what comes next. The second uh, problem stems from the fact that SRLs are not typically legally trained and don't necessarily have an understanding of the legal principles um, and ideas that underpin the decisions that are made in the family court. Instead, they frequently present with more moralistic or individualized ideas about what would be appropriate in their case, what is a right decision and what would be a wrong decision. And it can be very difficult to disavow these ideas, uh, especially if SRLs have not had prior access to legal advice, which gives them that understanding of their legal position. Uh, but also this is particularly a problem in family law because the issues are so personal and so close to home that it's sometimes very difficult uh, to suggest a different um, interpretation of what might be a right decision, what might be a wrong decision. And so in response, uh, judges and lawyers will often try and adapt the process to create space within that process, to, um, to create opportunities for them to be able to translate and explain these legal concepts to SRLs in lay terms. So for example, a really common strategy which uh, arose a lot across all of these different research studies was the ways in which judges might uh, conduct their legal conversations with opposing lawyers in cases that involved representation on one side. So they would talk to the lawyers first, deal with all of the legal considerations, discuss what uh, relevant law we needed to talk about, and then turn to the SRL to discuss how uh, to translate and to explain uh, how that would all work and to ch check their understanding and to make sure they felt comfortable with the way that law uh, was applying to their case. 
Unfortunately, that's not necessarily always perceived as a positive thing by SRLs. So this is a quote from Grace, who, uh, who experienced a hearing in which that um, adaptation took place. And she explained that they would talk among themselves in legal type language. And I was just sat there waiting for it to be translated, but you don't know what they said at first or if they're saying all of it to you. I think this is a really interesting um, way of illustrating that efforts to make the hearings more accessible to SRLs, to help SRLs by trying to translate uh, legal terminology, can actually be perceived as exclusionary by some SRLs, especially if there is already perhaps a seed of mistrust uh, in there, uh, in the sense of uh, not being able to understand what is being said about, uh, about the case. And in contrast, uh, there, I wanted to also draw a parallel with Sarah, who was a mother who uh, was self-representing against her ex-husband, who started off represented, but then lost his representation mid-case, uh, which meant that Sarah had an experience where she was self-representing in a case which was entirely unrepresented, there were no lawyers involved at all. And in comparing those two experiences, she explained that the hearing involving no lawyers was actually much more positive for her because the judge was obliged to talk her through every single aspect of the case. And there was no opportunity for this kind of splintering of conversations into legal, legal conversations and lay conversations. It was all um, accessible the whole way through. And looking at this, I think it's quite obvious to some of us that the judge in this case had to take a, an actively inquisitorial approach to this case because there was no support in the way of any other legal professionals in the room. And of course, although this was perceived as overwhelmingly positive for Sarah, we are aware of the fact that this would have created additional um, and probably quite significant pressures and burdens for the judge concerned. And the third problem I want to talk about, um, is, which is the final problem, is the perceptions that SRLs may have of the legal system if they have these kind of negative experiences. Those who have negative experiences of the legal system might disengage from the legal system, which is concerning in itself, but also they may um, leave the process with misconceptions or negative views about how that process works. For example, they may leave the court process with the idea that courts favour mothers over fathers, or the idea that lawyers are just in it for the money, or maybe even that the court process has some uh, confusing or mysterious way by which it makes decisions, um, which means that people are actually unable to influence the outcomes of those cases, even if they go to court. And I think this is really well illustrated by this final quote from Gary, who compares the court process to being like a game. He says, it's like a game. In fact, no, it's like a game of chess because nobody normal understands how to play chess. And I think this is a really um, useful quote for illustrating how SRLs may perceive the court system as something which is designed to exclude them. And I don't think his use of chess as a comparator is a coincidence. I think it's actually something which cuts to the heart of how SRLs may leave the process, feeling as if uh, it's a space which is designed in an, elite, an elitist way, a way to exclude them. So having talked through some of those problems, I think it's now useful to touch on some of the possible solutions. Across these different jurisdictions, there have been a whole host of proposals which have been made. Uh, and, but broadly, they can be categorized into kind of three main suggestions. The first is to get them lawyers. So in other words, to uh, campaign for increased investment in legal aid, to expand the eligibility requirements of legal aid to include more people, or to put pressure on legal services to conduct more pro bono work, uh, with the idea being that we create a situation where nobody feels they have to self-represent. This is an ambitious idea, but I, my instinct is that it is quite idealistic as well. There will always be economic constraints which will dictate the availability of legal aid. And there will always be a degree of pro bono work being done, but at the same time, that degree of pro bono work invariably depends on the capacity and the willingness of the legal profession to essentially conduct their services free. The second option, which is commonly raised, is to make them lawyers. In other words, to train SRLs, to provide them with enough information 
and uh, support so that they're able to navigate the court process more effectively. And this might include things like putting guides or um, uh, information on court websites or providing information and non-legal support through volunteers at charities, or perhaps even expanding the role of court staff to include the responsibility to provide practical assistance to SRLs when they turn up at the court process. And this is a very pragmatic idea. It's very useful and it's likely to be very useful for lots of SRLs. But the biggest criticism of this suggestion is that it hinges entirely on the ability of SRLs to actually operationalize that information, to actually be able to put it into practice um, and to apply it flexibly when things perhaps don't go to plan or not in the way that's expected. Essentially, there will always be a proportion of SRLs who will require legal assistance in a one-on-one -on -one format. And so that suggestion is always going to be limited to some degree. The third option is perhaps the most radical because it changes our emphasis. So instead of thinking about how we might change SRLs to fit within the legal system, it asks us to think about how we might change the legal system to fit around SRLs. And this approach is really well illustrated by this quote from Justice Oakes, who asks us, invites us to reflect on whether the practices we follow, the laws we make, or the processes by which we reach decisions actually need to be as complicated as the public might perceive them to be. And I think this is a really interesting idea because it's something which we have already been particularly confronted with over the last few years, especially during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic, of course, has disrupted lots of different things in our lives, but family law has been no exception. The requirement to rapidly shift uh, court hearings into the online environment has created significant challenges for everybody involved in the legal process, but especially those who interact with SRLs. SRLs, um, in short, if they were struggling to engage and participate before the pandemic, then there is significant concern about what that will mean for their ability to cope when we shift those hearings into an online environment where everybody is unfamiliar with the processes and customs. But at the same time, it has also forced us to abandon some of the procedures and traditions which have historically created problems within the relationship between SRLs and the family justice system. So in this sense, I think it has also also prompted us to rethink what works and what doesn't work in hearings involving SRLs in order to create online hearings which work in practice for all participants. And so I think that's a really interesting um, launching point because it has also prompted a rethink or prompted an opportunity to rethink how we might prevent people from getting to that point of crisis, that point of self-representation in the first place. Increased use of uh, remote and hybrid methods of communication, for example, in advice services uh, can mean that people may be more likely to engage with these services at a much earlier stage of their family dispute. And this is because they may be able to engage more easily through low stakes communication methods like instant messaging or phone calls in a way that they may not have expected or anticipated that they would do before the pandemic. And this, if they do earlier engage at an earlier point, then this is a really important opportunity to capture and triage these people at an earlier stage, to identify their needs and provide them with an upfront um, range of options that they may be able to take forward in order to resolve their problems. And if we do manage to um, capture them at this earlier point, then this is a really important chance for us to try and avoid uh, the escalation of these problems or the splintering of these problems into other legal problems. And for this to be effective, what really is required is a range of bespoke and flexible services which uh, create the option of choice for people when they engage with these services. And this is both a challenge and an opportunity in the sense that by offering a range of uh, choice in terms of the options that are available to people to resolve their disputes at this early stage may improve their uh, improve the take up of services and encourage them to engage with them more comprehensively for the consequences of their problems uh, require them to and if we are able to achieve this then this can in turn ease the pressure on the court system 
and facilitate more flexibility and capacity there in order to more appropriately support uh, those who do end up relying on its services. Thank you so much for uh, listening to this. I'm really keen to engage uh, with those of you working with SRLs or in the court system uh, or interested in talking more about this issue. So please do uh, reach out if you'd like to talk more. Thanks very much, um, Jessica. I think your presentation will um, have resonated very strongly with, with, with many of us. Um, and I think you've given us lots to be thinking about and um, talking about um, this morning. Um, just a reminder to people, if you've got questions, to, to pop them in the um, Q&A. Uh, to date, we've got one that's come in. So it'll be, there's, there's an opportunity here to, um, yeah, put, put some questions if, if, if you've got things that are, are, are burning on your mind. Um, just, just in reflecting, um, I think self-represent litigants really do fit the classic definition of um, what we would describe as a wicked problem. So one that's difficult to solve because we don't have complete understanding or information. Um, one that is experienced by different people or interests in different ways. Um, one where there's complex um, interdependencies. And I think what you've really opened up today, um, Jessica, is, is, is that independency between different parts of the justice system. So namely our legal assistance services and what we're able to do or not do um, for different types of people and also our, our courts and, and tribunals. Um, I think the, the nature of the SRL problem, if we call them uh, as a problem, which um, is, is, is certainly very, very common language, um, but it's undoubtedly different, as you mentioned, for, for court staff, for judicial officers, for legal practitioners, um, and for self-represented people of, of, of different types. Um, and also, um, presumably, for public legal services who may be trying to do that early intervention and, and, and early support and help people to prepare better for, for court proceedings. Um, I think your, your research makes that absolutely clear. Um, but what are some of the things that we need to know more about and, and, and what do we need to do to collect that information to get a better sense and perhaps to be able to um, address this, this, this wicked problem in a, in a more meaningful way, perhaps to, to change the system in, in some of the ways that you're suggesting? Thanks, Hugh. That's a, it's a really good question. I think that's the that's the struggle with doing research in this area. There is, is such a, a large amount of information, lots of studies that have been done, but at the same time, there are a lot of gaps um, that we need to address in order to be able to actually develop solutions in a way that would answer the question in the in the way that we've been talking about. And um, I think the biggest data gap, especially post-pandemic, in my view, is we need to have more efficient and more effective data collection strategies in terms of how hearings are being adapted, how hearings are being run. Are they going online, hybrid? What's the flexibility? What's the uh, formats that are being used? And are those those that are typically uh, favoured by the court process or are they typically those that are requested by the SRLs? And if so, um, how is that working in practice? There have been a few rapid reviews into the impact of COVID on the courts system in terms of, oh, there have been more hearings that have been running on uh, Zoom or Teams or um, WebEx, and there have been some that joined by phone. And so there's some initial information there, but it's really nothing consistent in terms of what's being regularly done. How is that working and how effective is it from everybody's perspective? Um, Sorry, there is also, also I would say is that FDR outcomes are also really important as well, so knowing how effective those uh, dispute resolution mechanisms are and what formats they're using, what typical kind of responses are being used in response to different SRLs at the point that they present. Um, so yes, I get like drawing the link between FDR and also the court system, I think, just like you said, seeing them as two parts of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think among the among the solutions that uh, Jessica uh, mentioned was getting people, um, getting more people lawyers, um, and helping people 
to be lawyers. Um, uh, it, it's not difficult to imagine a world where we're told that there will never be enough uh, resources to give everybody who would benefit from having a lawyer access um, to a lawyer. And I guess that's the that's the legal representation gap or the justice gap that um, we're also familiar with. Um, but we do have a range of other legal assistance services. So we we provide uh, as a as a society, we provide a lot of legal information, education, advice services um, to people who don't qualify for uh, legal casework or representation um, services. Um, Bridget, this is an area you work in. This is an area we discuss all the time. Um, so from, from your experience, Bridget, what, what do we need to know um, about what these services do? Um, and the difference that, that they can make. Thanks, you. Um, it is a question we're offering, <laughs> discussing together. And it's what uh, we need to know more about is the, the value of that lawyer. We have a lot of ideas about the role of the lawyer and how it supports resolution in these cases and lo with lower intensity services, such as info, advice, duty lawyer. But we don't have a lot of evidence of what is the value of the lawyer how are we helping get to resolution and for what type of matters what type of clients and in what circumstances and if we can start to unpack that and which lower intensity services are more likely to lead to resolution we can start to think about our service mix and how do we sort of uh, go well these are the types of issues that lower intensity services can't help so therefore how do we mix things up how do we look at things differently and we need to focus more on the outcomes and the outcomes of and for us it's the outcomes of the lawyer support we know uh, we think there's a lot of value obviously in a lawyer not just for that initial issue but for the um, clustering of issues as Jess talked about and early intervention in one issue often leads um, is uh, support with one issue is often early intervention for a number of other issues and stops escalation but we need evidence of that and we need more longitudinal type studies to really unpack that holistic value of having a lawyer even for lower level uh, cases and, and what that looks like for what clients under what circumstances um, to, to look at them as a whole. Mm, I think, um, thanks um, again, agree, agree completely. And um, I think there's always been this uh, view and there is this opportunity that the right bit of legal advice at the right time can potentially make a big difference both for the individual and the system um, as a whole. Um, so, you know, there might be benefits in investing in upstream um, legal advice uh, for downstream um, benefits. Um, but I think I think Jessica's presentation also reminds us uh, clearly that that not all self-represent litigants are unitary. They're not all the same, um, and that some of them. Um, will have ex, um, access to some form of either private or public legal assistance prior to court. Um, one of the projects we've been working on at um, Victoria Law Foundation is our data mapping um, project where we're looking at the use and utility um, of data in um, the Victorian justice system. Um, and one of the things that we've found is it's, it's pretty clear is that we really don't have sort of, a, as Jessica alluded to, much information about how self-represented litigants uh, vary or about uh, what impacts different types of self-represented litigants um, may have. Um, and then presumably what the benefits may or may not be um, or different types of strategies to engage with different types of um, litigants. Um, so, so Jessica, is, is there any sort of things um, that you particularly think would be useful to know um, or perhaps to more um, carefully measure and monitor? Um, you've alluded to, to, to data collection. Are there sort of particular things that, that you have in mind in, in, in that respect? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, everything that Bridget was saying was so um, spot on in terms of the initial point of contact is really crucial in terms of identifying what those different needs, what those different issues are. And so in terms of what we 
really need to focus on is most of the most of my research so far has been focusing on what we can learn from people who are at that end point who have escalated to the point of no return and have reached the court process and think okay well how can we work backwards from there but at the same time I think we need to be doing a bookended approach we need to be looking at well how do people initially present when do they initially present what kind of issues do they present with um, and what strategies work for those issues at what point do uh, certain methods of dispute resolution achieve uh, only partial solutions and how might we address those gaps so it's almost kind of needs to be a continuous um, stream of data collection both up and downstream I suppose um, and especially post-pandemic if there is an opportunity for people to engage at an earlier stage then maximizing that is really important so if people engage more commonly via an instant messaging service or a phone call now than they did before the pandemic, how can we then respond and adapt the processes and, and the services to make sure that we can engage with them via the method that they present at and we ask them what they would like. And the idea of autonomy is something which is often overlooked within family law, this idea that um, actually giving somebody choice about how they resolve their dispute uh, and how they prefer to do it can actually be um, a really good way of encouraging them to engage and stick in that process as well. Um, I think from a from a research evaluation or learning um, point of view, each each of us um, on the panel today are, are very much interested in, in, in this question of, of, of what works and what works for self-represented um, litigants. Um, but is that just a, a question of uh, funding for, for 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 assistance and services? Is it funding for data and research. Um, I'm a professional researcher, so I'm self-interested. I'm always going to say there's a role for, for, for more research um, and, and, and learning. Um, uh, Bridget, do you have any ideas? I think um, as also <laughs> an evaluator and researcher, obviously funding, I think it's also, um, what we fund, what in terms of research and evaluation and that view um, that it's, uh, we need, I think as sort of talked about more that longitudinal view, that perspective of, it's not just about the immediately presenting legal problem, but it's about often the complexity, the clustering and what's the value to a client um, over time for a range of their issues and how does, you know, legal support, I guess I'm coming from the what the value of a legal support agency can do, how does that support other um, issues going on for a client? So I think it's about the view. I think it's about that outcomes perspective. But I also think if we've once we've got the results, it's about the funding and the appetite to do things differently. Because if we're just funding our endless evaluations and research that are telling us we need to do new things, um, as Jess referred to, she talked about the bespoke and flexible services and changing the system. If there's no appetite and opportunity to do that, then we're just going to be re-prosecuting the same case again and again with our evaluations. And so it's finding not just funding, but the space to do things differently, genuinely differently, and not just in one-off pilots, but how do we actually then really change the system to, as a result? And how do we use clients to help design those new systems and use and elevate their voice? Mm. Um, some of our close friends would describe uh, Australia as the land of the pilot, um, and, and they do uh, describe... <laughs> Australia like that uh, at uh, just about every opportunity that comes up. And I think that is sort of um, one of the differences um, between uh, jurisdictions um, or countries. Um, Jess, have you, have, have you had the opportunity to have any sort of um, reflection around those sorts of issues or um, any other thoughts about um, what what we need to do to build that sort of what works evidence base, um, particularly in Australia, but also um, based on the benefits of your sort of global global research, um, because you know I think I think you made it quite clear um, we're dealing with similar issues in in several countries, so there's there's an opportunity to to be doing things and, and learning from each other. Absolutely, but I think there are also a lot of um challenges to do with that level of research as well which have 
permeated across those countries in the sense that you're absolutely right, there is a temptation to go for shiny, exciting pilots and try new things, really, in, uh, really innovative strategies, because those are the kinds of things that research funders would like to fund. Uh, and they're very exciting and very good to, to put on promotional materials. But at the same time, we haven't actually got any of the, the foundations done. We haven't got the, the knowledge or the evidence um, about how legal advice makes a difference to legal problems. And actually that's quite important. And doing that foundational work might seem quite dull because we take, we assume that we take it for granted because we all know from personal experience, the way that it, it does make a difference in lots of cases, but you're almost kind of skipping a step by not doing that groundwork um, or having that evidence to, to hang everything else on. So it's almost kind of, we need like a combination. We, we're inevitably gonna be um, guided by the, the funders and the sort of research funding in that sense but uh, doing that foundational work is also really important and would have a global impact in terms of giving everybody else something to hang on so that other jurisdictions would then go off and do their shiny pilots and then look back uh, and we could learn from lots of different things. Mm -hmm. um, I think shiny pilots sort of naturally brings us to the, the issue of technological transformation so we currently are sitting on a cusp of technological disruption, technological change within, within the justice system. Um, we've had long predicted radical transformation of the justice system. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, based on your, your presentation and, 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 and what uh, we know from um, other observations, um, that COVID-19 really did accelerate some change, made things um, that were previously perhaps thought of as being something that would, you know, uh, eventuate down the track rapidly led to, to change. Um, I think we can predict that some of that change is going to be permanent and long lasting, um, particularly around hybrid forms of, of legal assistance, hybrid forms of uh, court tribunal process and justice resolution. Um, but do you think, yeah, do you think technological change is the thing that uh, potentially provides the opportunity to, to change the, the system? Jess, if you want to have a crack at that. I think it's um, something which was perceived as a potential solution long before the pandemic. It was something which was held up as the, the panacea, something which would save costs, but also improve outcomes. And that assumption was not, they hadn't done the groundwork necessarily. Um, and by they, I mean kind of governments or policy funders, et cetera. Nobody had really done the groundwork in actually establishing whether or not that would be the case. And then all of a sudden we were forced to embrace it. And now the landscape has been transformed. And I don't necessarily think it's just being held up as a solution anymore. I think it's part of the fabric of the environment in which we're working. And public expectations of legal services and courts have changed. People now expect to be able to zoom into meetings and, and to be able to engage in remote formats. And so we almost kind of need to catch up with that before then evaluating, okay, well, what works and what doesn't work? Does this provide the solution in the way that we all hoped it might beforehand? Um, and again, that comes back to needing to know more information. I think it, we need to know a lot more about which groups tend to engage in which ways and how and why and how effective that is. Um, but essentially, I think the concerns with holding up technology as a catch-all solution before the pandemic apply nevertheless now as well. This idea that technology will, of course, be part of the solution and it can improve accessibility for so many people in lots of different ways but it should really only be kind of seen as one tool in the toolbox. It's not just the answer to everything. It's, there's, there is also a need for a lot more. Mm. Um, Bridget, do you have any thoughts? Um, I agree uh, totally with what Jess is saying. And I think we've just got to be cautious that we don't, uh, uh, digital first isn't digital only. And I think there was a great quote. We've uh, recently did a client survey on their experience and there was a, great quote um, from one of the clients in relation to COVID and saying, I was not aware until this legal problem how necessary it is to be literate and tech computer confident to be able to interact with the legal or court system. My case was conducted via the web. 
due to COVID, I suppose, even though I am educated and have smartphone, notebook, it was all still stressful. It made me think how difficult the legal process would be for someone who was not confident in English literacy or in computer skills or had no access to technology. And I think once again, as Jess was talking about, whenever we think about these solutions, it's understanding for who they work and how do they help resolve an issue and for what type of matters and then who else and therefore what other support options. But anything that can increase choice and therefore a sense of empowerment and feeling helped is, is a great thing. But yeah, it's better understanding once again for who under what circumstances. I, think, um, I can see we've had several questions um, come through. So maybe, maybe we'll um, turn to some of the questions now. Um, so there's, there's a question from, um, Jenny around, um, and just maybe this is this is for you. Um, has, has there been any uh, finding in relation to um, SS, um, SRLs using sort of limited scope services from a private lawyer? Um, you know, such as uh, help with drafting documents. Um, do do we know anything about how prevalent that is? How often it happens? What difference it makes? Um, so, you know, pointing to the role of uh, private practitioners in, in meeting um, the need for, for legal assistance, but perhaps if, you, if um, a person can't uh, afford to purchase representation services, purchasing limited scope or, or unbundled, unbundled services from private practitioners, I think you um, mentioned that. Do we know how much of that goes often and what difference that makes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we don't know necessarily how much is as a proportion of SRLs, but it is definitely very common. Um, and just like I mentioned that some SRLs may target their the resources that they do have at accessing legal advice outside of court in order to then conduct the litigation themselves to save costs. Um, this is definitely true. And there were um, three people that I interviewed, actually, who had done this and they took a range of different strategies uh, in terms of how to maximize the value of their limited resources. So some of them would um, make an assessment based on how they perceive their own strengths and potential weaknesses in the court process. And so if they felt that they could express themselves very well in person, then they would um, make sure to target their funds at the lawyer to try and get as much help as possible with preparing paperwork and, and bundles. Um, and in contrast, if they felt that they could write quite well, but they wouldn't very, weren't very confident at standing up and speaking in court and they would uh, do the opposite they would they would um, try and do most of the work themselves but then target the funds at advocacy so actually that that reveals a whole um, other area of questioning that we might need to look at in terms of people who just have people representing them not necessarily having um, that prior groundwork done uh, but yeah essentially um, uh, one example which was really interesting for me was someone I interviewed who said if you're ever using a lawyer, make sure that you save up all of your questions until the very last moment, and then you put them all in one email to your lawyer so that they have to answer them all at once, and then they spend less time and they bill you for less time. So mm -hmm. that was a way of kind of reducing the costs that she was going to um, incur, but at the same time also created other problems because then the lawyer wasn't giving a comprehensive view of her situation and couldn't pick up other things that she had included in that list of questions. Absolutely, you know, there's absolutely an educative role that um, we can do to help people become a better and more savvy uh, consumer of, of private um, legal services. Um, there's a question from Thelma around, um, or just did, did your research touch on um, SRLs from different um, cultural groups or do you have any insight as to what we do know about potential differences for people coming from different cultural groups or different language groups? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a few people, again, obviously there's, there's data in, in the large scale studies as well, which indicate the prevalence of people experiencing language barriers, et cetera. But in terms of qualitative insight, I interviewed a few people who um, for whom English was a second language and they would do things like take their court paperwork to their friends to try and get them to explain it to them in a way which was more accessible. Um, or um, there would also be kind of uh, cultural dimensions that we may not anticipate as well. So for example, um, women who had 
um, Islamic marriages would perhaps not anticipate that their marriage was not legally recognized within England and Wales, and therefore they would have all of these other legal implications of, of their situation and would also be dealing with potentially Sharia councils at the same time as the family court. And it just it's a whole other level of complexity beyond the issues that we're talking about in terms of self-representation. So we definitely need more insight into those beyond just yes this proportion of SRLs are from a different cultural background to the normal expected of white British secular etc. Mm. There's a question from Amy who's um, pointing to I think you mentioned this as well just around that translation role and um, that SRLs really do want to have their, their, their voice um, heard um, and the extent to which lawyers are able to do that translation role and give voice um i guess i guess that sort of will depend if it ends up being the other side sort of lawyer who's helping out or um perhaps it's also around lawyers in advance of um a court who can help people uh present the best case for themselves or or, or the key issues or create that opportunity you know you, you've got a right to bring this issue up this issue up and this issue up so that um the court's made aware of uh circumstances and so that you're you're heard um maybe, maybe this is a, this is an unfair question um but yeah that translation role is that um something that lawyers can get better at Yes, definitely. Although I think that there are bigger challenges at play um, in the sense of, of what um, across all of these different jurisdictions, one of the biggest issues was um, the mistrust that can stem from facing a lawyer on the other side and the idea that they may be better positioned to put themselves across in court and therefore more likely to take advantage of you or more likely to to run the hearing in a way that excludes you. And so um, especially in jurisdictions that rely on the kind of convention of pre-hearing negotiations where outside the door of the court you would discuss the issue with the other side and try and narrow down the issues at the last moment before you go into the courtroom. Lawyers often do try and engage in that process in a way which is friendly and, and try and um, engage the SRL in order to uh, try and narrow down the issues and to help them but actually that can be perceived as the opposite effect. They can be seen as quite intimidating um, and it's very difficult. It's difficult to know how to approach that kind of interaction in a way that doesn't give off that impression. It's really difficult to, to be able to give guidance to lawyers in that sense, because every SRL is different. Every person mm. will interpret that differently. What some might see as helpful, others will see as a, an attempt to try and um, intimidate them. Mm. Um, there's an observation, what a question from um, Sam here around um, whether people understand sort of the role of family dispute resolution and, and what uh, services and practitioners in that um, space are, are trying to achieve. That is, you know, it is trying to uh, resolve family law issues and avoid that escalation um, and entry into the, in, into the court system. Um, yeah, do you, think, do you think we've done enough to, again, be educating and supporting um, litigants to to understand the different roles of uh, different parts of the uh, dispute resolution process. I think there's always more that can be done in that sense, especially um, and the best example I can give to illustrate it is from England, England and Wales, unfortunately. So, but it's um, the way that if if people don't have access to legal advice as a starting point, that tends to be a major referral point for people to be able to then go and engage with something like mediation because the lawyer has been the one to encourage them to go do it to explain what the value of that process is and how it can help them and without that initial starting point the actual uptake of mediation is, is much lower so I think that translates across to the Australian context in terms of if people understand that the service is there and what it's for then yes of course that will help but perhaps the starting point may be uh, very important in terms of flagging up the, what those potential options are and how they might help and giving kind of bespoke advice as to which of those options might be most appropriate for their circumstances. Mm. Um, There's another observation from um, D 
Debbie, who's a family law um, barrister, um, reminding us um, that in her experience, an overwhelming percentage of self-represented litigants um, do have mental health issues um, and they're often at the, you know, the, the complex pointy end of, of cases. Um, and there's the, the issue of, you know, un, unrealistic um, expectations. And I think, I think your, your research and, and your presentation today um, uncovered or shared that once again. Um, do you think that is an issue in and of itself that we could actually be doing more to um, communicate to um, you know the people responding uh, responsible for funding our courts and tribunals, um, communicating just just the nature of the problem in a better way. Again, thinking about it from a wicked problem point of view, um, if we're able to understand and see and articulate the different dimensions of problems in in a different way, um, would that make a difference? In terms of, um, yeah, I mean, this goes back to the upstream downstream thing we were talking about in terms of this idea that if, if problems are identified and clarified at this really early point, then that's a really good opportunity to set expectations in relation to each of those problems and help people to draw the connections between those problems. Um, because I think that when your relationship breaks down in particular, it's a very understandable tendency to focus on the most immediate consequences. So what's happening to me right now? What do I need to fix right now in order to secure my position? And then the other things may fall by the wayside, but those of us with legal experience will understand that, that the potential for those other problems to escalate and to complicate and to splinter. And so taking proactive action and encouraging um, and explain to people the benefits of taking proactive action and the consequences potentially of not doing so would be a really useful way of kind of empowering them at that initial point of the process, I think. Yeah. Um, I'll try to let you off the hook a little bit, <laughs> Jessica. Um, so I'll put these, these, these next couple to, to you, Bridget. Um, there's a question from um, Sue Scott. Hi, Sue. Good to see you. Um, has anyone done any research on the cost to court? of SRLs, um, you know, the, the idea that if you put money into early intervention, supporting SRLs uh, better, presumably, um, what the downstream benefits are. I, I, know, I know legal aids are uh, involved in such a, a project at the moment. Or maybe it's not strictly the, the cost, but looking at the benefits of um, early, early resolution, the early resolution service? Yeah, um, we are. And we have, we the cost one is one we'd love to explore further. Um, and particularly looking at the downstream, not just the individual that, uh, black and white of that legal problem. Um, I think it'd be great to do some cost benefit analysis of SRLs versus uh, represented and and what are those bigger issues um, we have done we have done a recent evaluation of another early intervention service our help before court service which was a new service um, for Victorians seeking legal assistance for summary crime matters and there was um, as always there was some evidence that um, it did lead um, having um, this uh, complementary service earlier did lead to early resolution of some cases and fewer court events, particularly adjournments. And so we could, you could take that further if you did some further work to do some cost and also improved the summary case conferencing process. So there would have been costs um, saved there. So I think that there can be further work done to develop these initial threads. We're starting to unpack about that reduction in adjournments um, earlier resolution of cases and you know and, and what that then translates to so I think if that that'd be something we'd love to further explore um, as I said and particularly thinking about that downstream effect and the wider benefits um, of legal or non-legal representation. Mm. Um, there's a question from Ross around um, has there been any modelling um, done on the benefits of increasing legal aid funding um, in terms of more efficient uh, use of court resources? I know this is a question we've spoken about, but are, are you aware of any 
any modelling that's going on? There has been, there is some modelling being done by our finance um, and with they're um, looking at those sort of things and putting in some bids, funding bids based on that modelling. But I think it's, once again, really we need some further evidence about the benefits and to feed in and actually um, putting some, you know, some uh, evidence of the, we've got a lot of ideas of the benefits, we can sort of make a lot of claims, but really we need more robust evidence of what is being achieved for what type of matters and what type of clients. Um, and we need we need funding to do that and get that evidence. As we've talked about, it's sort of, it's hard and it's, and it's hard and I think really doing a great study of uh, self-represented lawyers, self-represented litigants and represented clients and understanding, you know, how they go through the system, how they experience it and what outcomes are at the end um, would be incredibly valuable for the system, for the widest findings, for the wider system. Like some journey mapping work and looking at what upstream can make a difference to downstream. Exactly, um, and and some and but taking time, having that longitudinal view. I think we often, because we are in this pilot thing, it's often a let's look at the clients from this, you know, this six month thing, this one year. But we need that longer term because those downstream benefits are often far longer term than a pilot period um, can give us. Um, I think that brings us to time, um, and so apologies to the you know. Uh, Great questions and great engagement in in the Q and A today. We, we're just not going to be able to to get to any um, more more questions. But I might um, yeah throw back to Lynn at this stage. Thank you, Hugh and Jessica and Bridget. It was um, really interesting, and I think uh, as you said earlier, Hugh picks up on a lot of threads that we're familiar with, but I think exposes a whole lot of work that needs to be done from here to really understand. Uh, an issue that is not going to go away. As uh, Jess pointed out, we've seen a, a significant increase in the volume of, of cases, family law in particular. We, I think we have probably not yet seen the peak that, uh, that will flow out of, of, uh, of lockdowns and, and COVID in general, and uh, that's going to put increasing pressure on the system all around. So we really do need to understand. I was very heartened by that quote from Justice Folks about let's look at the system and maybe it doesn't need to be as complex and as arcane um, as, as the, the system currently is. So maybe we're beginning to see uh, the beginnings of an alliance around the various parties that are really profoundly involved with this to address the, the core issue around the complexity of the process and the access of people to appropriate um, justice. So thank you all three of you very much indeed, but particularly to Jess Matt. Great to have you on board and, um, and we will certainly distribute the, uh, the video of this event and notes about your forthcoming book and look forward to, to contact uh, again in the future. And as you are no doubt aware if you're a regular attendee um, at these events, research network uh, webinars happen quarterly and our aim is to bring you insights into both international and domestic developments in access to justice and legal need. So we're always on the hunt for new and good ideas. So please get in touch if you've got an idea of something you'd like to hear about, or if you yourself got a project or an area of, of investigation that you'd like to showcase, get in touch with us. Alex Partington is the person you need to speak to. Thank you again for coming today and feel free to share the, uh, the content to all your colleagues and friends, uh, both through the um, direct mail that we'll send and also on our website. I'm just gonna take this moment to flag our next major event, which is our annual Law and You Forum, a panel discussion that, uh, that we hold each year on an issue of public interest, but which has a, a very uh, critical legal dimension. And this year I'm very excited because we're looking at a pathway to treaty in Victoria. What are the organizations, what is the process and what's the progress thus far in this incredibly exciting moment in time in terms of developing uh, a treaty for our state. So stay tuned for more information about that. It will be coming soon on our website. And thank you again for coming. Have a lovely day.